And we all want to reach our potential. We all like think about I would love to invite everyone to think about a, a time in in your life where you felt like you had a mentor or a leader that really believed in your potential. Right? That feels so meaningful to have a leader give you an assignment because they see a potential in you that you don't even see yet for yourself, but they believe in you so fully that you want to try, you want to work hard, you want to get there, and they support you. And so contribution, community, and challenge are the three main pathways to making work more meaningful. Welcome back to The Thermostat with Jason Barger. If you're currently on a commute, a walk, or just a micro break in your day, glad you're making time to step back, to think, and to reflect on the next steps on your journey. I've never been more convinced the best leaders and team cultures in the world are the ones that make time to step back, breathe in good oxygen, and calibrate their thermostat. I hope today's conversation leaves you feeling grounded and inspired. Now let's dive into today's topic to engage our minds and hearts in order to authentically lead and create compelling cultures wherever we are in the world. Hey, everybody. It's Jason, and welcome back to the Thermostat Podcast. Wherever you are and however you're coming to the pod today, thanks for taking time to step back, to align your thinking, set your thermostat, and just breathe. As always, my purpose for these podcasts is to create a space in your day, in your week, uh, to think about some ideas and and have some dialogue that will breathe some good oxygen into you. Uh, before we get into today's episode, will you please do me the favor uh, and rate this podcast uh, five stars, of course, and also leave an authentic review uh, with your own words about the pod, how it's, you know, any of the episodes that have resonated with you. Every time you share your own thoughts authentically, of course, uh, and also are willing to share the pod with other people in your network or on your team or throughout your organization, that's how these messages spread. And I I thank you very much for doing so. Uh, Today's episode is part one of a pre-recorded conversation from my Thermostat Cultures live event that I host in Columbus, Ohio in November um, and also have virtual participants from all over. Uh, This past November was a powerful event, and this conversation that you're about to hear was just a part of that inspiring day. Uh, You're going to hear me joined by my good friend and author, researcher, consultant, Tamara Miles, as well as friends Marty Bledsoe Post and Dr. Ariana Howitt from Nationwide Children's Hospitals On Our Sleeves program for mental health. So with that uh, being said, now I'll take you into the room for part one of this very important conversation. Conversation that we're going to begin, you know that I love this phrase, conversations are the currency for change. Conversations are the currency for change. So what we're doing today is we're going to have a lot of conversations with the people around you, with some wonderful guests that I'm going to invite either on the screen and or to come up front here. And we're going to have some conversations that are going to be the currency that are going to stimulate some change. That's the way anything changes in our individual relationships or with our people is eventually we got to be willing to talk about it and say, well, what is, we got to verbalize what is it we want to be different. And we're going to have that. So uh, out there online, if Scott, if you can pull up tomorrow. I want to invite our first guest who actually is coming to us from the East Coast. If we can pull up Tamara. One second. We've got... There she is. Hi, good morning. Hi, Hi, Tamara. So for anybody who doesn't know, this is Tamara Miles, my friend. This is also the great privilege of this kind of event is I get to invite wonderful people and friends and uh, mentors and colleagues and folks that inspire me to be a part of this and join me as voices. Tamara not only is an author and a speaker and all that kind of stuff, but really has done a ton of research. Uh, She and her business partner, Wesley Adams, have done some great research. You've heard me reference in the past, and and she's a, a past. She was in this space last year. She's going to Brazil tomorrow uh, to be with family. So she is coming to us virtually from the East Coast today, but uh, did a lot of research around meaningful work cultures and what's happening in the world. So Tamara, first of all, welcome. And I'm excited to hear what is some of the research saying right now of that weirdo world that we've been living in? 
whether that's related to the great resignation, quiet quitting, these phrases that we've heard, what is the research about work telling us right now about meaningful work cultures? Well, thank you for having me. And I must admit, I, I have such FOMO not being there in person. <laughs> <laughs> so hopefully next year I can be there in person. Um, there's so there's a lot of research and data coming out, and you know we've all heard quite quitting, great resignation. Um, the most interesting piece of data that I find is uh, a global study on the great resignation that found a huge disconnect between the reasons why managers and leaders <clears throat> think people are quitting and then the actual reason why they're quitting. So, you know, leaders and managers think people are quitting for uh, greater work-life balance, less burnout, uh, better pay, um, and more flexibility. And then the real reasons people are quitting are some of those, but at the very top, people are quitting because they want to uh, find more purpose at work. You know, the great resignation allowed us to step back and reevaluate the role of work in our lives. And we started asking questions like, is this how I want to spend my time? Does what I'm doing matter? And that reflects in the great resignation of people trying trying to find more purpose-driven work. And then the second most cited reason is because they don't feel like their managers care about them. Right? We all want to be cared for and cared about. We want to feel like we matter and like the work that we do matters. And so there's a little bit of a misalignment there on, on the research. And then quiet quitting is really interesting because um, like there's two ways that people you know talk about quiet quitting. One is the idea of disengagement. It's like quiet quitting being a new term for an old problem. And then the other way is people trying to set boundaries and create more work-life balance, right? And so um, there's different solutions for, for both. Um, and, uh, and I think meaningful cultures and meaningful leadership and making work more meaningful through some of the practices that, you know, that we've uncovered on the study is, is a great way to solve those problems. Yeah, yeah no, no. And, and Tamara, if you would, because a lot of these people, and again, we've referenced this meaningful work culture study and, and this work certainly in the past. What are you seeing? What are some of the places that now as we look at the, you know, this, now it's, what, what is it, 40 million people now that have, have, you know, resigned from jobs, and yet all the, the research research and studies saying, well, what is it that they're looking for? And, and, and so much of it points back to this idea that what they're looking for is to be a part of a more meaningful culture and to be, and be, some, be a part of something that actually helps bring out not only their gifts and their strengths, but helps them have value and connect to the values and belong as a part of something that's bigger than themselves. What is it? Are there some practices or some things that you're seeing right now that as this we've we're coming out of the pandemic, some trends that you're seeing related to that? Yes. Um, you know, so we've spent, so Wes and I spent the last year trying to translate all the academic data into an actionable, actionable framework for leaders. Um, so, so we uncovered uh, 26 specific leadership practices. And when we look at them, we find that they fall under three main categories, what we call the three C's of a meaning mindset leadership approach. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so the three C's are contribution, which is what you mostly think of when you think of meaningful work. So the sense of wanting to add value, to contribute to something larger than yourself. So that's the whole purpose and understanding, really understanding how is it that what I do every day contribute to the organization's mission, to my colleagues, to my family. So really drawing that direct line. So that's contribution. The second C is community. So what you talked about belonging, that's really important. So leadership practices that build community, um, things like uh, uh, making space for authenticity, for people to show up at their as their whole selves, amity, so build, uh, really intentionally building our social networks at work, making space for people to connect outside of just a working relationship and also just outside of their silos, but within other um, functions in the organization is really important. Um, and also 
understanding the value alignment. So do my values align with the organization's values and how? Because the more value alignment we are, the more um, we can feel a sense of belonging and build trust with each other. And then the third C is challenge. So that one is really about learning and developing and growing healthy challenge with support is really important. We all want to reach our potential. We all like think about, I would love to invite everyone to think about a a time in, in your life where you felt like you had a mentor or a leader that really believed in your potential right? That feels so meaningful to have a leader give you an assignment because they see a potential in you that you don't even see yet for yourself, but they believe in you so fully that you want to try, you want to work hard, you want to get there and they support you. And so contribution, community and challenge are the three main pathways to making work more meaningful. If you haven't done so already, we hope you'll visit Amazon or Amplify or JasonVBarger.com to check out Breathing Oxygen, my new book that is all about breathing good oxygen into ourselves and mindsets that fuel ourselves and the teams and the organizations around us. Positive, healthy thinking is as essential to great leadership and building a winning culture as the air we breathe. Leading yourself and a team of people has never been more complicated than it is today. As a leader, every move you make is either breathing life into your organization or slowly killing it. The atmosphere can easily turn toxic with negativity, blame, and and doubt poisoning the culture. Just like every being on the planet needs good air to breathe, every organization needs leadership that breathes life into its people to sustain the energy required to complete its mission. Breathing Oxygen focuses on six key leadership mindsets that breathe life into any team. Clarity, inclusivity, mental agility, grit, rest, and ownership. Join us, read, and share Breathing Oxygen. Available now from Amplify Books on Amazon and jasonvbarger.com. And so contribution, community, and challenge are the three main pathways to making work more meaningful. Love it. Love it. And so obviously some of that stuff that comes out in the data is just if you're somebody who's an analytical person, a data person that's like, yeah, I need to, be, I need to see proof that all this stuff around leadership and culture is important. All of it hits you right in the face. And, and anytime Tamara and I have talked about this stuff, it all just comes up right in front of us. That again, you may not be somebody that needs this as reassurance to you, but you also, or you may be somebody that, yeah, show me the data, but that all these people that have been quitting jobs, looking for jobs, that they're looking for this, where can I feel valued and feel like I belong and create a sense of belonging? So now that we're coming out of the pandemic, places that have been really intentional now about gathering with people again and realizing that we've been, you know, we've been kind of, uh, you know, virtual meeting fatigue in the in the, the not good way of doing virtual meetings. Hopefully today is going to be really engaging and interactive with the people. But this this you know, kind of reporting out of just ongoing virtual stuff that's transactional in nature that we've started to realize that people actually want connection with each other and they want to feel like they belong. And the other piece that you just talked about in terms of challenge is that part of the research is also saying that people, we've, we've always known that part of the, you know, the old saying that people don't leave jobs, they leave, they leave leaders or managers, right? They leave people. We've known that, but we've also, I, I, what's, you know, contrary to what many people think, is that right now people are also looking to be challenged. That people want to be a part of cultures that help them grow and develop and believe in them. And so are we actively creating that for the people around us? Are we helping to create that sense of belonging and that sense of value, but are we also having that challenge that we're putting out in front of us. So Tamara is the wonderful expert that we're going to pull on some of this research, and she's going to pop in uh, from time to time this morning to remind us of some of that research that's really baked into all of the conversations that we're going to be having. So Tamara, I'm so glad you're with us. Stay tuned. We're going to bring you back in uh, at different times. But now I want us to, I want us to chat. 
And again, this isn't going to be me and, or any other people talking at you. This is going to be a conversation that we're going to have uh, together. And I want, to be, I want this first uh, time that we get a chance to do this to be an extension of what I just invited you to think about, which is maybe uh, interacting with some people that are outside of your core team. There's going to be some times today where I'm going to have you actually huddle in your your organization that you came here with so that you can have some of those kind of conversations. But here, real quickly, I want you to huddle with two, three, four other people that are in the room, and, and uh, Scott's going to put us into some breakout rooms in groups of five or so in just a second. And I want us to have just a little 10-minute interactive conversation with, and I'll, we're all adults, but I'll let you pick who you want to connect with outside of your team, but to huddle together. And, and here's a conversation I want us to just kick off this morning. What would you celebrate about your culture, the team, your organization, the what, you know, wherever it is that you are? What would you celebrate about your culture coming out of the pandemic? Maybe things that you've learned, maybe things that you are experiencing right now, maybe even it was challenging things that you actually uh, are celebrating now because it's, it's taught you something. What is it that you would celebrate about your culture coming out of the pandemic? And then, what is a challenge or, I'll say, an opportunity that you are now facing in your organization that you're trying to chew on? How do we engage our people? How do we engage our culture? What kind of leadership might be needed? So what would you celebrate? And what is a, a challenge or opportunity that you're facing that you see? Does that make sense? Let's connect with each other and get the uh, culture and the mojo in this room going. About 10 minutes. All right. I will, I will continue uh, throughout today to remind us of just the amazing people that are in this room. And really, uh, part of the power of today is, is to have this group of people together. So I really encourage you, again, introduce yourselves, connect with each other. We have a lot to learn from each other and with each other. And so... Uh, We'll keep kind of nudging us uh, to do that because uh, that's one of the joys, too, for me to know that you all are meeting each other is, is really, uh, really, really cool. Um, did you know that the Surgeon General just recently uh, named workplace health as a national crisis? Wor workplace health <laughs> was identified by the Surgeon General of the United States of saying this is something we need to give focus to, attention to, that people's health is being impacted by their workplace environments and their own mental health. And so as we, as we take some time today to step back and think about our, our own leadership and how we show up for people, how we manage ourselves and navigate our way through everything we might be facing in our own lives, let alone in you know, our organizations and all the things that we're trying to accomplish, thinking about our own mental health and then thinking about the culture in which we are creating that helps care for people and support people in the midst of the challenges they might be facing is maybe one of the most important things that we need to be doing right now in terms of our own leadership and the cultures that we create. And so I'm excited to invite uh, some guests up to have a little conversation with us and get us thinking about this from a leadership and culture uh, standpoint. Uh, coming up on the screen from Chicago is going to be the executive director of the On Our Sleeves program from Nationwide Children's Hospital, Marty Bledsoe Post. Uh, a friend of mine is going to show up and going to be connecting with us virtually. And I'm going to invite Dr. Ariana Howitt, who's with us here in person, clinical director for On Our Sleeves, to come join me up here. Hi, Ariana. Hello. How are you? Good. How are you? We got Marty out there. Have we, have we tracked Marty down? I see her. Hey, there's Marty. Can we hear Marty? Can you all hear me? Good morning. Hey. Nice to see you. How are you, Marty? Hey, Marty? Doing well. How are you guys? Doing well. Glad to, uh, to have you. So let's start out. Uh, some people know On Our Sleeves or know of On Our Sleeves. Certainly around this area, a lot of great stuff has been happening. But give us the quick kind of what is On Our Sleeves, just a little, uh, you know, catch us up a little bit if, if somebody doesn't know that. Sure thing. On Our Sleeves began four years ago as a campaign out of Nationwide Children's Hospital in Columbus, Ohio, to try to break stigma around children's mental health. And it has grown over the last four years to become a national movement in its own right. So we have expanded beyond Columbus. 
with a mission to get evidence-informed educational resources to every community in the United States around children's mental health. We want everyone to understand and promote mental health for kids, just like we do for each other for adults. Awesome. Awesome. And I know Ariana and Marty jump in here at any point, but I, uh, what, so what are we seeing in terms of research? And uh, I think it's such an interesting thing as we talk about our own leadership and we talk about culture is to think about it in the, the kind of impact that it happens when our kids aren't healthy, mm-hmm. of then what does that mean for the parents? And then what are the parents that are going to workplaces that you see this kind of ripple effect that takes place? What are we seeing in, in research? I, I want Marty to answer this one because this is fresh off the press. We just did a workplace study. We looked at how children's mental health is impacting the workplace, the, the working parents and caregivers. So I'll let Marty jump in with our findings. Well, I love... I love this question, and for anybody in the in the room or in the Zoom call thinking, why is a children's mental health nonprofit speaking at a workplace culture event? I want to explain that we actually because I'm a weird see- guy. <laughs> that's the, that's one of the answers, but yeah. Well, I, I, well, I won't deny that part, Jason. I know you well enough to say, <laughs> okay, yes, and. We have seen in our data a a big connection between people's work decisions and what they're dealing with at home. So I really like that you called the last couple of years the weirdo world. I wrote that down. I think that's such a nice summary of what we've all been through. And while we were all in the same storm, so to speak, we were in different boats. And you've probably heard people say that, too, about the pandemic. And One of the things that we saw with parents in particular is that the stresses of the pandemic and the resulting lockdowns and and disruptions, parents who have children who now might be struggling with a, a mental health concern or a mental health issue or a development issue are really feeling pressed to decide the priority between staying in a job, um, or staying in a, in a format of a job, maybe versus handling a rising problem at home. So for workers who either don't have children or whose children are a little bit older or who are so young that they don't really didn't realize it was a weirdo world maybe, um, it might not be as impactful as those parents whose kids are now still struggling. Maybe mm-hmm. they're more anxious. Maybe they're struggling in school or they're behind. Maybe they've lost social connections through this time. And so in our study, 30% of the parents we talked to said that they had either changed a job so they'd actually left, been part of that great resignation, or changed the, the way they work, the parameters of their job, in the last two years because of their child's mental health. And to us, this is a really interesting connective finding. I loved what Tamara said about the culture and the, the need as leaders to create something that a parent or a worker can feel connected to. I would hope the parents who felt the most connected to their culture are the ones who stayed I think those who felt disconnected, perhaps what I need to to look around when push comes to shove between what I got to do at home and what I need to do at work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we were having conversations about just how hard it is to be a working parent in, in general, right? You're having to balance so many things. And one of the parents we talked to in our study, uh, their quote stuck with me because she described her child started to experience anxiety during the pandemic. And she said it was a full-time job. That, that was the language she used to try and advocate for her child. I was talking to teachers, the principal, the, the school administrators, evaluations, therapists, psychiatrists. It was full-time job to get that help. And then there's also the parenting side of things of, I was also trying to do the social activities. I was trying to make sure they're doing well at school and I'm doing my job. And what we know is that unfortunately, from symptom onset to the time someone gets help, it's 10 years. And so- 10 years? 10 years uh, on average nationally. Yeah, yeah. And so imagine having to be a working parent and do the full-time job of advocating for your child for 10 years. So I'm not surprised when our findings show that a third of parents are deciding to leave work, to, to be at home. 
Yeah, and I think other research that we know of that started to surface around the pandemic, which again, this may feel like Captain Obvious to many of you, but but we started to see a spike in you know, alcoholism and, and drug addiction. We started to see divorces were going up. We started to see mental health issues. All of these things that, that clearly people were under stress, which brings us back to then in the workplace, in, this, uh, in a world and in a time when it's often do, 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 do more, and we have this kind of treadmill that many of us are on, what is it that, and many of you know that I talk about this idea of kind of busyness versus effectiveness, mm-hmm. of how do we, what, what do you see from a, a behavioral standpoint of not only teaching kids, but how do we help get ourselves out of this just do, 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 and, and, and really transition into what does it mean to be, mm-hmm. and then let our, oh, I talk about our being drive our doing, if that mm-hmm. makes sense. Yeah. I loved your six A's that you were talking about earlier, because in therapy, I often talk to my patients about valued living. And and it's similar. Stop and reflect, right? What do you care about? What do you value? Is it family time? Is it work? Is it citizenship? What is it that you value in your life? And then after they rank different areas that they value, we rank how are you living, are you spending your time? And, and we find these huge gaps. A disconnect because, between yes. this is what I say I want and then this is what, what I doing. actually do. Yeah, okay, because yeah. people are going, going, going. Yep. And we have to stop weekly, daily, right? Yeah. All the time to reassess. Am I living that way? And then setting my goals and then acting on that. So, so your six A's are wonderful and, and something we talk about often in therapy. And, and I think that children are watching us. So if we're constantly doing, 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 they're learning that's what I have to do. And so we have to start modeling the stopping, the reflecting, the living according to my values. Marty, I want to pause and, and let you jump in if there was anything that resonated with you in that. Well, I think it's very important, as Dr. Hoyt said, that we actually walk the walk. So we can tell our children or our students or our team members, you know, it's important to step back and reflect. But if we don't actually show it, then they will follow our behavior, not our words. And a friend recently shared with me that her daughter who struggles with um, pretty significant anxiety was trying to prepare to go on the eighth grade Washington, D.C. trip. And the itinerary comes out, and it's something like leave at 5 a.m. on a bus, ride whatever, five, six hours to get to D.C., get off, do like three museums, go out to dinner, attend a sporting event, and get to the hotel, get to the hotel. They're checking into this hotel <laughs> to stay with a, in a room with three other classmates at like 1030 or 11 o'clock at night. And the parent was like, this is not going to work for my kiddo. And then as she told me this, I said, well, why should that work for any kiddo? I mean, that is such a packed agenda. So if we believe that we should step back, let's talk about what we want to get out of this trip. Let's between museums two and three, let's all sit and do some breathing and some reflection or some mindfulness. Uh, She said, no, they do have reflective time built in. It's at 11 o'clock at night. And I thought, well, (laughs) what are we teaching them? (laughs) Yeah, and yeah, so, and, and again, if, is, if we as leaders and humans, if we are uh, modeling that, then we are perpetuating that same thing. And really, the culture that we're, we've talked about at different times with teams, what the, I love the Plato quote, what is honored will be cultivated. What is honored will be cultivated. And so if we show that that's what we honor, then ultimately what we're going to cultivate is this, this culture then that perpetuates this busyness rather than this effectiveness, meaning, again, not just of an output, but how do we navigate our way through challenges and obstacles and learn how to, to, to be more effective in whatever it is that we're trying to do in our being, not just our doing. Uh, I want to make sure I get this, this, uh, this from the Surgeon General that I, that I just referenced, this stat right. It said, from the study that they've done, it says 76% of U.S. workers report at least one symptom of mental health. So, and again, if that's the beginning of a 10-year now that I just learned that, wow, that's something. And that 81% of, of U.S. workers, 81% say they're looking for workplaces that support mental health and better conditions. So uh, that may seem obvious to you all, but we have this 76 or 81% of people that are saying, hey, I, I experience this and I need this. 
And so what, what are some tips that, what, what can we be doing as leaders and within teams and organizations? Anything that you all would recommend or that you see? And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring Tamara in in just a second, too, because I know she's going to have some ideas. But uh, The thing that immediately comes to mind is that when we talk to working parents, they shared with us that what you're saying, we're worried about our children's mental health. It's getting in the way of work. But they also told us we don't feel comfortable talking about it. I, I don't feel comfortable talking to HR, to my boss, to my colleagues. And, you know, there's a lot of stigma behind mental health, and even more so for children, because parents have that fear of, I'm going to be judged, they're going to think I did something wrong. And so uh, we talk at On Our Sleeves a lot about how people are leaving the workforce, but we may not know why, because they're not talking about it. They're not telling us, look, I was experiencing this tug between my home environment and work, and I ended up choosing home. And so... As leaders, we have to set the tone of normalizing, talking about our mental health, our children's mental health. Uh, We were just talking in our small group about when we take a day off, saying, like, I'm taking a day off for my mental health and being honest. You don't have to go into detail, but setting that tone of it's okay to take that day and and it's okay to to share a little bit is important. I agree with that. I think the... the the overt statements around things like I'm taking a day for my mental health or even something like, again, not the detail, but I'm supporting my child through a developmental issue or a mental health issue or something like that, a a concern so that people can understand and clue in. Because if you said I'm supporting my child through a physical diagnosis, people would instantly support. What can I do? Can I take an assignment off of you? Can I cover you in a meeting? Can I, you have to be at that appointment, mom. You have to be at the doctor, dad. Like if if it's cancer or something like that, the the support like floods in. And in this, we, we hold back a little more. So I think the more we can talk about what the parent is doing, the more the leaders can show that they support when parents need to flex in and out for that. That is critical. And the other thing we can do is remind our, our teams what benefits they have available. Mm-hmm. The, the corporate world carries a lot of weight when it comes to benefits in this country. Companies can put a lot of pressure on payers and insurers to make sure that benefits include mental health coverage and include it in a way that is more about sustained help and not just mm-hmm. acute help because it's not the same as a broken arm. So companies can advocate for better mental health coverage and then communicate that to their teams. In fact, of working parents in our survey said jobs that provide child mental health resources and benefits are more attractive to me than jobs that do not. So they're starting to ask this when they consider, where should I go work? Mm -hmm. And I think that that is going to be critical for leaders to keep that front and center uh, as they're trying to recruit the best talent. And I'm going to pull Tamara in here for a second because I want to make the connection between meaningful work cultures and this conversation around mental health. But about the taking a day off or the the support that we give to that, let me just share this stat that that, uh, right to pre-pandemic, so my guess is it's gotten even worse, but right before the pandemic hit, did you know that, that Americans left 768 million days of vacation on the table? 768 million days of vacation that they had that equates to about a $66 billion of lost benefits. Mm. So benefits that are set aside and, and, and there for people. And, and so we, again, as humans, we aren't modeling and or taking care of that ourselves is what the research would tell us. And also what it leads my mind to go to is that means our places of employment, we probably are creating a culture where people don't feel like they can or I'm I'm not able to take a day off. And so then $66 billion of lost benefits and 768 million days of vacation go unused. Tamara, what is this telling us about creating, you know, work cultures, meaningful work cultures, and what's the connection that we're seeing in the research between mental health and all this stuff? Anything you'd add? Oh, my goodness. I have so much to add, and I love this conversation and this data. Um, So two things that I want to say, what they were saying about leaders role modeling. Um, Jason, you know that we found that in our research again and again and again. So um, there are five behaviors that 
that lead to a toxic culture. Mm -hmm. And the highest predictor of toxicity in a work culture is a lack of integrity in leadership behavior. So, you know, if if our core values at work are um, respect each other and we are honest, you know, integrity. And, and as a leader, you're like, you know, this is how we live our values at work, but then you don't behave like that. If you say we value mental health and openness, but then you work in ways that are different than valuing that, that is an instant meaning killer. So role modeling behavior is just entry ticket for a meaningful work. It is a necessary but not sufficient condition. Mm -hmm. And so one of the most powerful um, workshops that I did last year was actually during Mental Health Awareness Month in May. And it was for a global organization with hundreds of thousands of employees. And they're very committed to continuing to strengthen their culture. And so they had me come in and run this uh, panel. And five of, of their most senior leaders came in and talked about their own mental health struggles, not in a way that was oversharing, but in like, what are they doing to protect their mental health? Um, and some of the things that they do was role modeling that, was blocking time on their calendar to go for a walk and actually putting that on their calendar and sharing it with their team. And, you know, so it's like micro behaviors that you can do that really have a ripple effect. Um, and so I encourage leaders to do that, to think about their behaviors, because there is a, a certain behavioral and emotional contagion, right? And people look to leadership to set that tone. And so I completely agree with what Marty and Ariana were saying, that is uh, absolutely critical. And then the other thing I will say is that um, mental, you know, with my positive psychology training and approach, the absence of mental illness is not the same as mental health, right? So we can um, minimize pathology and we should, um, but that only gets us to neutral. Mm -hmm to what we call languishing, Adam Grant's um, yeah, big yeah, article, yeah. right? And we don't want to languish. We want to thrive. We want to flourish. And so, yes, minimizing um, mental illness and pathology is really important in addressing those and role modeling. But it's also equally important to work on flourishing, developing our potential. How can we have more positive emotion at work? How can we savor together? How can we acknowledge um, and recognize each other? How can we build community, belonging? How can we feel like we're reaching our potential? All these things, they can coexist. And those are the cultures that become the most meaningful and support our flourishing and our mental health the most. Thank you for listening to today's podcast, and I hope the messages and questions stimulate positive change along your path. As always, if these messages resonate with you and add value to your life, I hope you'll help amplify them throughout the world. Please rate, comment, and share on whatever podcast or social media platform you're using, and share this podcast with the people in your life or work who should be part of these conversations. That way, this spirit does, in fact, spread. If these messages or developing leaders and culture would be helpful to you and your organization, please contact us at jasonvbarger.com, jasonvbarger.com. And remember, we are all ambassadors for the culture we want to create in our life and work. We have to own the vision we want to be a part of. The future of leadership is you, is me is us. Be a thermostat.